Okay, cool. Um, and so we've got the incredible Dave Sharp with us today. He's going to be teaching us and sharing knowledge with us about um, marketing, in particular with architecture. He's one of the, the best in the world um, at, at doing that. And then I'm going to be covering um, some fundamentals that we we coach our architect, architecture clients on, uh, ranging from mindset, um, profitability in your business, and data points that you need to be measuring, um, and essentially how you can make instant changes to your business to, to have it grow, succeed, and just do more uh, pretty much overnight. Um, so Dave, over to you. Do you want to maybe kick things off? Yeah, should I get into it? Yeah, go for it. All right, cool. Let's do it. Ah, enable sharing, mate. Oh. <laughs> there we go all right am i good to go all yeah, right let's good go. To go good to go cool and if anyone's seen me give a presentation before i'm sorry about the orange slides blasting you at nine o'clock in the morning but there we go um hi everyone i'm dave sharp i'm a marketing consultant and coach for architects and i'm just going to give a short presentation on some beginner, some beginner friendly strategies to market your architecture practice. Um, so thank you for um, to Cooks and Action Coach and, and Prague and everybody for inviting me to come and do this talk. I, I, I have had so many clients go through Action Coaching programs, various kinds of programs and come out the other side like amazing superstars. And so I was very excited when I got this invite um, to come and talk to all of you as well. So a few things about me, uh, as I mentioned, marketing coach and strategist, I'm a graduate of architecture and I was in the industry into, until 2016 on the architecture side and then left to focus exclusively on marketing and social media and all that kind of stuff. I'm based in Melbourne, Australia, but I work remotely with clients in the UK, uh, Europe, USA and New, and New Zealand. And to this point, I've advised over a hundred small and media and size practices on their marketing strategy. I'm also the host of a podcast called The Architecture Firm Marketing Podcast, um, which we don't actually talk about marketing that much, but I interview um, really successful architects who are doing something really special with their firm and, and talk about kind of their journey and how they got there and some of the um, some aspects of their strategy. So getting into this talk, a lot of architects struggle to share their work and their ideas. Um, I, I don't even necessarily say they struggle with their marketing. Um, that might be even overcomplicating it. Most of us have good work and we have kind of really nice practices that have good values and good process and good ideas, but we just simply don't really put them out there though, that much um, or enough. And we, it's like we spend hundreds of hours working on these incredible projects and then we spend, you know, two hours or 20 minutes kind of distributing them. And that's often a big part of our problem. So the typical architecture practice that I encounter is, you know, usually posting once or twice a month on Instagram at best, um, not using Instagram stories. They're not active on any other social media platforms. Their website doesn't really reflect their, their practice as far as they're concerned. And it's not really generating any meaningful leads, but they're not really doing anything to address it on a regular basis. They, do, they typically don't have an email newsletter um, or they do, but they only send emails like once a year or at the end of the year. Um, they often wait for journalists to approach them to publish their projects rather than the other way around. They do invest in quality photography, but it doesn't necessarily go very far beyond maybe a single post on Instagram and an updated page that kind of gets lost somewhere on the website. And quite often a practice won't have a blog to help share their ideas, values and process. So there's great content at the core. There's great stuff that we want to be putting out there, but so often we're just not doing those things. And there's many reasons why that might be happening, but oftentimes it's just that we're kind of overcomplicating it. You know, it's like we're agonizing over what running shoes to buy when we should just be going out there and running, right? It doesn't have to be that complicated. So I'm going to show you some really sort of effective and simple strategies that can get you started on the two most popular channels for distribution for architects, which is Instagram and getting published. So if anyone's seen my Instagram webinar before, some of this stuff is going to be kind of, they've seen it before, but I've updated a little bit and there'll be some new stuff in there and it'll be a good refresher. So Instagram and getting published, they're two super important channels. And that's where I kind of want to get started with you um, at the time today. So Get ready to take some notes because I'm just going to be going through some real steps here, almost exactly at, that I would give to my clients um, that I'm working with. So first step is, um, I guess, seeing the bar pretty high, but invest in the best architectural photographer you can afford. It doesn't mean you have to go out and hire one of these guys on Instagram, like, you know, Rory Gardner or Click Clip Gym or anything like that. 
that's maybe something to aspire to one day. You don't have to be spending that kind of money, but you should, you should really focus on investing and making sure that you're working with somebody who's very competent and really does specialize in architecture because these photos are going to be the core of your marketing. Like they're the foundations. Everything else is going to be built on showing your work in the best possible light. So I always include that as the first step because not every architect realizes the importance of the decisions they make around photography. Um, next up with Instagram, you want to start thinking about how you can begin to establish a look and feel for your feed. So some accounts do this better than others, but you want to start thinking about what's our plan. What do we want this feed to look like? Do a little bit of a mood board, even, you know, make a fake account. I've done that exercise with clients a number of times and gone, let's just grab images externally and put them together and create a demonstration or a mock-up of the kind of Instagram feed we want. So if you're looking for a template or some more advice on this, you can Google Instagram template for architects. And I've got a blog post that kind of touches on this. And there's a Photoshop file you can download and some helpful tips on that. But this is a great example, Tria Studio, really nicely organized feed. And we all like this kind of feed. And I think it, it helps you to stand out from other accounts. And it can be really great in terms of helping you get more followers because more people that visit your profile will think, hey, this account, they kind of care about what they put out. So it's really helpful to have a nice layout. And you want to back that up with a plan for what images you're going to need over the in the near term, right? Let's say over the next 12 months. So what you want to do is think about what portions are you going to give to different categories in that plan? So you know you're going to have your professional photos, either existing or brand new from your photographer. So those are taken care of. But what else could go in your feed? And come up with some portions that are going to give you an idea of once it translates into numbers, you know, how many times are we posting per week or per year? That starts to give you some numbers of what you actually need to prepare. So you have 52 professional shots, but you might, you might know we need 21 model shots. We need 16 renders. We need 10 sketches. So it's really important to come up with a plan like this for your practice, because if you just feel like week to week, we have to come up with something for Instagram, that's just setting yourself up for disaster. You really want to be thinking about it, like almost like, getting your portfolio ready for the end of, you know, end of semester at uni, right? I'm going to need this many A3s. I'm going to need this A1. I'm going to need this drawing, these floor plans, these sections. You really want to plan out, then get to work. And I think it's a good idea to do that with your Instagram account as well. It'll also make what you do consistent because you're making it all <coughs> together at the same time. And so these are some of the common supplementary categories that can go alongside your professional photos model photos, uh, sketches, illustrations, landscapes, drone photography, site visits. You just pick and choose categories that you think reflect what your practice is about or the culture of your practice. If you're really into books and travel and getting published and flying a drone around, that's going to be you. And that should be what you represent in your feed. And that's going to be what differentiates your account from other accounts. But you do need to be organized and pick your categories. And don't be afraid to recycle. There is absolutely no rule written down anywhere that says you can only post a photo once. Imagine, again, the amount of work that goes into making a brilliant architectural photo all the way through from design to construction to, to taking that photo and then you share it one time, three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, and then it, we never see it again. That is so common. It's such a common mistake. You should be prepared to repeat your images. If you have 100 images in your portfolio, at two per week, that's only one repeat a year. You can easily repeat an image once a year. I've seen successful examples of 30, 40, 50,000 follower accounts where we repeat an image every three or four months. So with 100 images, you could effectively never run out of content. And so many practices have 100 or more images ready to go in their portfolio that they can start to use and be a little bit more relaxed about um, reposting. So I'm moving pretty quickly, but let's talk about captions as well. So when it, one of the biggest obstacles that architects have with Instagram is that we, we agonize over our captions. So we spend 80% of our time stressing out about captions, even though they're responsible for less than 20% of the results of our account. It's a classic sort of imbalance there. The thing that really makes your account grow is your images. And if they're being bottlenecked by the difficulty of captions, you're making a mistake. So what I suggest early on in the piece is focus on creating a simple and repeatable template that is going to be your default. 
So it could be project name in location shot by photographer. And then here's our hashtags, or it could be photography by this person built by that person, you know, and so on, right? You can absolutely get away with that. No problem whatsoever. Then later on, once you feel you're making good progress and you're rolling along well, you can start to come in and try a little bit harder on those captions, but there is, you do not have to do it from day one. So take a very simple, repeatable approach to captions. And then briefly on hashtags, hashtags are mattering less and less and less these days. They're not super important. We tend to worry too much about them. There's lots of methods for coming up with a good set of 20 to 30. You could either use a hashtag suggestion tool like built into later, which is a scheduling tool. There's another one called Flick. There's another tool called Display Purposes. Or you could do my favorite, which is just grow, go and grab some recent posts from a competitor or a relevant publication and dump them all into a word frequency counter. And that's going to tell you the most commonly used hashtags amongst those competitors. Then singly, you know, pick out the best examples for yourself but you just need a very general set that you can reuse from post to post. It doesn't have to be something that you come up with on the fly every time. Again, that's just going to waste your time. You're an architect. Your time is valuable. Shouldn't be spending, you know, micromanaging hashtags. Okay. So keep a simple set. And then finally on scheduling, you definitely want to use a tool like later and you don't want to be doing this on a daily basis. You want to be sitting down once every two weeks and scheduling out your posts. So that's just creating four posts. If you're posting twice a week, and so on and so forth, right? So you just sit down and do it in a batch and then you get on with life and you allow the tool to publish automatically for you. So there's a lot of things that this platform later does that makes your life a lot easier. There are saved captions. So you those captions we set up earlier, you would write them for each project and then save them so you can easily attach them to future posts. You would do the same thing with your hashtags and you would also use later's best time to post tool, which is a great tool, but don't stick to it too religiously. It's actually a better idea to create some sort of randomness in your Instagram schedule. You know, feel free to post at kind of different times and different days each week. You don't have to stick to a set schedule. Obviously you want to enable auto publish and most importantly, pace your library. What I mean by that is don't be too picky when it comes to choosing your next images, an image that you might personally or subjectively feel is not the best shot from that project could easily be the favorite shot for somebody else. There is, you want to give every shot a chance as long as it's been professionally taken and it's, and it's been something that's been put forward by your photographer as a, as a good example from that project. So don't be too picky and don't use all your favorite images in the first month. That's going to be a disaster. You just got to pace it, spread yourself out and that'll be okay. So next, we really want to take our best performing posts and we want to promote them because this is how you actually start to reach potential clients and grow your followers in a controlled way. So architects, we really want to grow our followers, but not all followers are the same. You know, some of them are in countries where you don't work. Some of them are in age groups that you don't work with and so on and so forth. You really want to have control over that. So that's why we think about running promoted post campaigns as a way of saying, I want people in this age group, in this area who like architecture. That's why you get followers that are going to ultimately convert into potential clients. And it's the most efficient way to do that. Um, so here's an example of just really quickly the method for doing that. So what I like to do is go into Instagram insights and organize all of your posts by reach. That's a good indicator of which post did the best. So the ones that have reached the most people have usually been the ones that have done the best in the algorithm. So those are the ones that you want to think about promoting. And you go through these steps, where to send people, your profile, define your audience. I've got the automatic option selected there, but you don't really want to do that. You want to go down to the bottom to create your own and go from there. And then you can set a location, an age group and put in some interests like architecture or and or sustainability and or passive house. There are tons of really great options for architects in there. So there's plenty of stuff that could apply to your work. And then set a budget, $2 a day, two pounds a day, whatever you want to do and run it for 30 days and then renew it or select a new image and do the same thing next month. That will massively help to grow your account, particularly in those early days. So on Instagram, overall recap, increase your frequency and the ratio of professional shots in your feed to speed up your growth. Get more efficient with your scheduling process. Do not waste time doing things that don't matter. Just focus on getting images out there consistently. 
recycle your images if necessary. Don't worry about running out of content and don't allow it to put your account on freeze mode for three months because you feel you don't have enough images. And finally, promote your posts to grow your followers in a predictable and targeted way. Um, a little bit here on how to actually get people from Instagram across to leads. And we don't have time to go through it in too much detail, but the essence is you really do want to be thinking about over the long term, it's more sustainable to try and get people to come away from Instagram. Once you've got them as a follower, you'll then want to get their email address. The importance of that is that you can't rely on Instagram to be there for you in the years to come. Things change, platforms sort of get popular and less popular. Yeah. So we want to be thinking of how we can get people across to our website and onto our email list. So usually that's by creating some sort of starter pack or a checklist or um, uh, some guidelines or a pricing report or anything. Um, or it could even be an event, a webinar, a workshop, a site visit tour, or, or some sort of um, short service that you might offer as such as a consultation. All of those things can be helpful. So maybe if you want to look at this a bit more later, you can come back to the recording and check it out. Um, important to do that. So promote every now and then you want to say, hey, we've created something really good on our website. Um, a really a, a, a starter pack, uh, something to do with your forever home and whatever. If, you're, if residential is not your space and you're in commercial, then you've got tons of other options there available for you too. But to get people to go, oh, I'm interested in that and go sign up for that. So moving on to getting published, you want to start by actually expanding your horizons in terms of relevant publications, because most of us only really care about one or two very desirable or prestigious publications in, in our market. But, you know, we're really limiting ourselves if we only really focus on one or two. There's tons of massive publications out there that could be relevant that are in our market that our potential clients are likely to be following. So to get a sense of what else is out there, it's good to familiarize yourself with that. And there's a post on my website, um, best architecture websites in the world, they're not necessarily the best, but they're the most popular, organized by popularity. And you might look at them and think, well, you know, the top ones aren't, you know, based in the UK. That's okay. You also want to include ones in the UK and you also want to include ones that are international because there's just as good a likelihood that your potential clients are going to be following Dezine as they're going to be following a local magazine. Um, not only that, good for followers, good for traffic, good for SEO. So you want, to, you want to broaden your horizons a little bit and not be too exclusive with your media selection. Um, from there, you definitely want to build a media database and get organized about that. Find the point of contact for each publication and find their contact info. So this is an example that I use. Very simple. Um, in this case, the list, you know, we're thinking about different focuses um, of the of each publication. So it, you can sort of sort through it and go, okay, where this is a residential project, we need residential publications and so on. But you just focus on publications that focus on the type of work you're doing, depending on what that is. And identify either editors or journalists that are there that are quite visible at that publication who write on work like yours. Um, and you can go from there. And it doesn't have to just be architectural media. You also want to be thinking about, you know, uh, real estate media and, and depending on what your niche is. I mean, if you're in education, education media, all sorts of different things. And we want to find their contact information. So, you know, I think if a publication has a publicly advertised uh, method to submit a project to them, I think you should respect that and you should follow that. And they might have a form, they might have a certain contact address, and I would do all the things that they would ask because it makes their life easier. But not every publication is that way. And often it's a good idea to just reach out to a journalist or an editor individually, respectfully. Um, and one way that you can do that is either they'll have their email address directly listed on their, on their website. Otherwise, you can pop them into a website like any mail finder and you can actually find people, um, find their verified emails, which is useful for sending your outreach. And finally, we want to set up a simple template um, that will accompany a media kit, which will be in the next slide. But I'll just quickly go through this example to show you. I mean, this is not a perfect example, but this is the sort of thing my clients send all the time and it works very, very frequently. Um, simple subject line, new house by, you know, Dave Sharp Architects in Melbourne. Hi, first name. Our practice has recently completed a new home for a family in this place. There's a few features of this project that could be a good fit for your publication. The wording around that, you know, something come up with something that you feel comfortable with. Then you'll just highlight a few major sort of focal points of the project or, or the concept or the brief or anything that's of interest that makes sense for that publication. Then you simply want to attach a Dropbox or Google Drive folder with the images so that they can very quickly have a look at them. 
and you want to attach a word document with a summary of the project and a brief on the and a brief background on the client and offer to answer their questions if they have any so really simple outreach just going here's the project here's a few things that are interesting about it and here's the photos and here's a document that will help you to tell you more that's really all you need. That's what a journalist is. Uh, that's the basic stuff that, that will just get them started and get them aware of the project. Um, a little bit more detail on what you could actually put in a media kit. So you really want to think about media kits um, in terms of what a journalist is really looking for. They don't have to be extremely complicated documents. Um, just this is a real example instead of being, this isn't actually a media kit. This is the start of a document that a journalist actually sent to one of my clients um, to say, this is the information I need to get started. And we can reverse that concept and put together the same sort of structure for our own media kit. The idea being that we can even just be more prepared than waiting for them to ask us. We can put that information together and we can make it super easy for them to publish our work. So the general structure project information, such as basic stuff like the name, the location, the client, et cetera. Information about the photographer, including their contact info and any special um, copyright conditions that the journalist needs to be aware of. Do we actually have permission to use this? How should this be used and so forth? Designer statement, so 200 to 300 words um, is usually yeah. good enough. Covering your concept and intentions, any difficulties you've encountered and how you resolve them, how you've used things like color, light, materials how you've implemented the client's brief and any features or focal points such as structural elements, details, lighting effects, et cetera. So that's, that's that. If there's any information about the client brief, we want to include that as well, any special needs or requirements. Um, and then additional information like the project team, the schedule, who were the consultants, and what sort of costs were involved. And finally, publications care a lot about this, but materials, finishes, and products. So you want to be able to identify any products that were used by brand name or type um, that appear in the images so that they can tag that in their articles and they can do all their things they do with these brands. So that pretty much covers the basic information. And what I suggest to all of my clients is anytime you actually get questions back from a journalist or an editor, you should actually track those and add them to an on a, a sort of an ever growing database of these are things that journalists want from us. And then you can start to reuse those questions for your future projects and answer them preemptively and then put that information into your media kit. So you might even add like a bit of a Q and A section to cover some of that other stuff too. So as far as the outreach process, I suggest breaking it into two phases. You wanna start with obviously your preferred or favorite publications. So you wanna reach out to them. That could just be one publication or it could be three to five and give them a really solid opportunity to respond and take an interest in the project. I, I should add though, that if you are dealing with print, if you are very interested in getting in a print publication, you would even wanna do that prior to that and be really clear about the fact that you're only gonna give exclusivity to a single publication or something like that, because oftentimes that's a requirement in print. But let's just say we're doing online only, we do a little first phase, and then we give them a little bit of time to respond before we move on to the rest. And when I say move on to the rest, if your media database has 20 publications on it and you've contacted three in the first round, just contact the other 17 altogether in the next round. That's just a really kind of efficient and streamlined way to do it. Um, editors are busy, so be patient, but remember to be remember to follow up and don't be afraid to follow up. You don't want to harass them with like 15 emails, but sending an email a week later just saying, hey, just want to see if you got this is not the end of the world. Um, uh, also, you can use you can use read receipts or you can use a tool like MailTrack if you're with Gmail that can give you an indication of have they opened it, have they clicked on it, what sort of stuff is going on there. So that's always an option as well. So get published, recap, research your publications, begin building a database that you can use. Now, there's, there's upfront work in that, obviously, but that will save you so much time down the road when you have a solid database that you can use every time set up a template and a media kit and break your outreach into two stages, your top kind of three to five, then focus on the rest from there. Wow. And that's it. So we got through it pretty quickly. Um, I, I was basically, if you'd like to learn more about, you know, me or about any of those areas that I brought, I, I brought up today in the talk, 
you can go to vanityprojects.com or email me at dave at vanityprojects.com if you've got any questions. I just quickly touch on this also. I do have a couple of webinars on my website. One in particular is focused around Instagram. So if you want to have a kind of a look at that as well, you can go to vanityprojects.com slash webinars. And we are going to do a Q&A at the end. So there will be plenty of opportunities. If you've got questions on any of that stuff, just bring it up later on. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, no hopefully worries. everyone found that massively, massively useful. A lot of value in that and how to just get out of there and do some of the basics. Um, I know I've been, you know, <coughs> sorry, I've, I've felt sometimes the pressure of trying to post all the time and it doesn't really need to be that complicated. Like you're saying, once you just have a, a structure in place that you know that you can, you can stick to, it makes things a lot easier. Um, just in the chat box, um, everyone who's managed to join so far, were you still having a lot of problems um, joining the event? Because I've just whilst Dave's been presenting for the last half an hour or so, I've I've been kind of on, on admin duty, um, responding to people who can't join yet. So um, I'm just sending a bunch of emails out as as this is going on to try and help others join up. But can you just let me know in the chat box if if anyone else had issues? Uh, yes. Very weird. Yeah, loads of people having issues. Oh, they had to change device. Right. Okay. Oh. Oh God. Wow. Okay. <laughs> we might, might have to remind everyone that they are going to get the recording. So anyone yes. who is here, you will get the FAQ. You know, special attention, but everyone else will just have to see the recording. Um. Okay. So troubleshooting options we're, we're all going to work together here this is i don't know if this has been done in a webinar before but we're all going to work together uh, and help others who have uh, having problems joining uh, the event so the meeting id um try a different device uh what else worked for anyone everyone else different browser try a different browser uh, restarting, let's have a look. restarting, Zoom. Um, so I'm just sending this, this out to everyone. Um, again, so if you, if you get this email, you can, you could ignore it. Uh, okay. So I'm just gonna, this is quite unorthodox. Have you ever done this before, Dave? No. <laughs> I've never had this issue before. I've never been this unlucky with Zoom before. It's always I know, I know, it's works. shocking. Touch wood. Let's yeah, let's let's hope it's uh it's um, a one-off. Right, thank you everyone for your patience. Let me just I'm just going to send this email out to, to everyone who's registered and hopefully it will help those that can't join to join. Um, but yeah, like Dave said, this will be recorded and sent out to, to everyone as well. Um, so, all right. Perfect. So, um, I'm just going to share my screen. If you bear with me one second. Can you see the presentation okay? Yeah, perfect. Um, so um, on, on behalf of Dave and myself and to everyone who's joining now, I'm re-welcoming everyone who's, who's new. And, and if you've been through uh, the, the first part of Dave's event, um, as I said, I hope you've enjoyed it and got value out of it. Um, and today is very much about you. Um, it's very much about what um, we can give you in terms of value and help you build your business, help you build your practices, help you build your marketing and, and ultimately thrive in what it is that you're doing. And the way that this works, as, as always, is participation. The more that you participate, the more notes that you take um, and the more involved you are, the more you're going to get out of it. Um, 
so uh, a brief, brief story about me. Uh, my name is uh, Kuldeep Singh Sahota, but most people call me Cooks. Um, and my story is as uh, such that um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, I've actually got three businesses and I used to be a, a client of Action Coach before becoming a coach myself. And I, and I still own my business businesses. Um, but I started off with uh, building 152 apartments out in India with a friend of mine where we, you know, I couldn't speak the language, but I, I took over the marketing, the branding. Um, I was involved with the architect in terms of giving some ideas, but whether the architect took the ideas on board or not, uh, I'm not too sure, but it was, a, it was a six million pound development and it was our first project. Um, and we, we sold it off plan and, and kind of built it from there. I sold my stake in that business and uh, started my family brand, which is what you can see on the right hand side here. Uh, where we started to make a chili sauce that my dad created and um, started in our garden shed. Uh, and it was a very exciting time. We were in all the newspapers, we were in the press, uh, we were on TV, uh, BBC radio. Um, we were being interviewed and we were being seen, sorry, and we were being shown the world over. It was a very exciting time. Um, I've got investment in, in the business, a few hundred thousand pounds worth of investment in the business. We started supplying the likes of Tesco, um, Ocado, Selfridges, uh, we were exporting around the world. Um, and, and very quickly, I realized I, I hated it. Um, it had taken over my life. Um, and, and ultimately, what I realized I had done was created myself a, a job that I couldn't leave. Um, and the reason I'm sharing this with you is that I know that there's a lot of people on this, on this um, webinar who you know, you sometimes you may feel like if, if you don't work, you don't get paid and, and it's, a, it's a challenging situation to be in. And um, what I did want to share is that there is a way out and there's a way to do things differently. Um, and, you know, you see that image here on the left hand side is um, it's from our Instagram page, 10, 17 p.m. in London uh, on a Saturday night. And I'm celebrating working, uh, working hard. You know, to me, that was a badge of honor. Um, but in actual fact, I was unhappy. I, I didn't want to be working on a Saturday night. I didn't want to be working 24 seven. My boss was a lunatic, i.e. me, no days off, no time off. It was affecting my health, uh, my relationships. I wasn't doing anything fun in life. Uh, and it was just all about the business. And all I knew was uh, I wanted a different life. I didn't want my, my old living room used as storage anymore. Um, and when I went through the coaching program, and started to get advice from, from experts, um, my life changed instantly. And actually on the way home from my first coaching session, um, I booked my first seven day holiday in seven years. So you can see here the picture on my right on the right hand side, uh, that's my wife and I in Greece. And it's the first holiday that we'd been on in seven years where there was no laptop, uh, there was no phone. And um, my business had started to work um, without me. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because um, I, I just want to share with you the fact that I am a business owner. I know what it's like and the challenges that um, we face as business owners, whether you're a, a solopreneur or you've got a, a practice with multiple people employed. Um, the challenges are the same. The pressures are the same. The responsibilities are the same. And so I get what that's like. And the reason I decided to become a coach was to actually help others get out of the space that I was in and actually start to thrive and build businesses that work without them. Um, so what drives change? What drove change in me? Uh, what drives change in you? And some of you um, who are on this presentation, um, on the webinar, you may have seen this presentation before. And I know some of you are clients as well of Action Coach. Uh, and I advise you to just go through this again with me because we always learn something new and we end up you know, losing about 95% of what we learn unless it's written down and we drive it home. But what drives change in us? Um, just in the chat box, I wanted to ask if anyone knows the story of Roger Bannister. Can you just put a yes or a no in the chat box if you if you know the story? Just wait for some replies there. Let's have a look. No, no, yes, no. No, no, no. Okay, great. So um, you can Google this, Google, Google this afterwards, take note of the name. Um, Roger Bannister was the first athlete in human history to, to run a mile in under four minutes. So in 1954, Roger Bannister was the first person to ever do it, uh, recorded. And um, 
it was incredible. The, the fact that up until 1954, no one else had ever been able to, to run a mile in less than four minutes. And then all of a sudden, here comes Roger Bannister, who, in fairness, didn't really try that hard, uh, but managed to run a mile in less than four minutes. And all of a sudden, the world was different. Um, because the fact that he'd run a mile in less than four minutes wasn't the amazing part. The amazing part was that there was now a paradigm shift. There was a mental change that had taken place by him merely achieving that feat. And people realized that it was possible. So what was possible in the past, sorry, what, was, what seemed impossible in the past was now possible because Roger Bannister had done it. And the, the record, believe it or not, lasted for 46 days. Then someone else did it in less than, less than four minutes. And since then, thousands and thousands and thousands of people have managed to run a mile in less than four minutes. I think marath marathon runners do it in two minutes now, which is insane. Um, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that there was a paradigm shift. And I just want to drive home the fact, up until 1954, no one in recorded history had managed to run a mile in less than four minutes. And then 1954 happens, Roger Bannister happens, and there's a change. 46 days later, someone else has managed to do it. And since then, thousands of people have been able to do it. So what drives change in us and you? So this is a concept we coach on extensively and we go quite deep into it and it's called the identity iceberg. 20% of what changes us um, is above, above the water. So it's our behaviors, the decisions that we've made, the actions that we take. So for example, everyone being here today, you've, you've made a decision, you've taken some action to join. A lot of you have been very persistent in, in joining because of the Zoom issues that we've had, which are brilliant. Um, but these are going to contribute to 20% of the change in you. Um, the real change starts to come as we go below the waterline, as we go deep uh, to, to the bottom of the, the, the proverbial iceberg. It's the new skills that we acquire, the new belief systems that we have. So, for example, if you've got a belief system around marketing, you know, that's something that Dave delivered earlier on in terms of, you know, posting on Instagram is hard. Building e email list is hard. If you believe these things to be true, they are going to be true. So what I'm challenging you here today to do is to make that paradigm shift in your own mind and to, to start looking at some of the beliefs which may be holding you back in your business and in your professional life. You know, what are your values in life? What are your values in business? You know, do you, do you value, um, you know, being on time? Do you, do you value, uh, you know, the highest quality work? Do you, do you value relationships? You know, really dive into what you value in yourself and in your, in your business space and, and see how are you communicating that across to your clients? Are your values positive values? What, what is it about you that may be holding you back from achieving your goals and, and your long-term vision? And finally, what is the identity? You know, what identity do you have? Your I am statements. Because if, if, if you know who you are and who you say you are, it can start to help you unpack what might be holding you back or what might be driving you forward. And you can start leaning more and more into that. So if I go back to the story I told earlier about working all of the time uh, in my business. At that point, I used to have the, state, the, the identity and the I am statement of I am an entrepreneur, I am a hustler, and I wore it as a badge of honor. And that was my identity. And lo and behold, that's all I did. All I did was work all the time. All I did was hustle. All I did was not have any time off. But when I made that mental shift and I changed my identity to I am a business owner, I'm an intelligent entrepreneur, and I started to think of myself as a different person. I am a, build, uh, a business builder. That in turn changed the way in which I approach life and I approach my, my business. And so with, with yourselves as architects, you know, you've spent seven years, eight years studying to be architects. The, the best architect that you can be, the most creative architect that you can be. And for a lot of uh, architects that we coach, that has understandably become your identity. You are an architect. I am an architect. And the question it, that you really want to be asking yourself is, you know, do you want to be an architect or do you want to be a business owner? Do you want to be a business builder? Because there's a very clear difference. And what I'm saying here is not necessarily that if you choose to change your identity to being a business builder, that you stop being an architect. No, not at all. But it's making that shift between 
learning the skills and the, the, the methods required to build your business so that you can practice your architecture for enjoyment and to build your business versus having to practice your architecture and discount your fees and do all these other things purely for the fact that that's how you pay the bills. Um, so it's very important to dive very deep and to explore what your identity is. But there's a final 5% that, that you, can, you can change now, here and now instantly, and it will start to make changes in your life. Um, and I just wanted to ask in the chat box, and if you've done this uh, presentation before, please don't spoil it for everyone else and, and put the answer in, but um, what do you think that final 5% is? What's the final 5% that we can change almost instantly to give us instant results? I'll just wait for a, a couple of suggestions in the chat box. Have a sip of water as well, because it's, it's quite warm here in London. Mindset, more coffee. Definitely more coffee, Jess. That changes everything. Um, mindset is interesting. Priya, do you want to expand on that? Any other ideas? No, no other ideas at the moment. The, the, the final piece of the puzzle, the final 5% that you ideally want to start on almost is your environment. So what does that mean? Your environment is the people that you're surrounded by, the knowledge that you're exposed to, the books that you're reading, the feed on your Instagram. Um, you know, are you speaking to other architects who might be struggling? Are you speaking to other people who are doing the same thing as you because if you are you're going to get the same results the mere fact that you're here today has meant that you've chosen to change your environment you're being exposed to to coaches and to knowledge um, that is going to help you grow so Dave one of the best in the world in, at what he does you're being you're changing your environment to be in the same environment as him which is going to have an instant impact on you and your business so if you go away today and start to make changes in your life uh, and sometimes it's not easy because it could be friends and family or co-workers or certain people in your life that you may need to cut out and change because it's holding you back. Um, it's worth exploring how you can change your environment and make, um, make it different and more uh, congruent for you to grow and succeed in life and in your business. So I just wanted to cover three areas of pain very quickly that most business owners in, uh, face that we coach and um architects in particular as well so time pain the fact that you're working all of the time or that you're always firefighting there's always something going on and so your time is constantly under pressure uh team oh god sorry so your team finding the right types of people or subcontractors um or freelancers to work with um and then the final one is money cash flow um you know lead uh, sorry uh, fee pressure you know, pressure on reducing your fees um, from, from clients and also profitability in, in money. You know, if you've got a long tail project where you're being paid over two to three years, you might quote in year one for a certain price. But by the end of it, uh, you know, have you really made profit on, on that particular project? So it's just worth noting if you want, you know, these are three areas of pain that most people face. And um, within yourself and your own business, have a little think about how these areas are causing you challenges in your business today and how you might address those challenges. So again, just looking for some interaction um, from you today, I just wanted to understand from yourselves, what is your definition of a business? So just in the chat box, if you wouldn't mind putting an answer, what is your definition of a business? I'm just gonna share some of the answers as we get them. No definition of a business. A place to work from Melissa. Okay, anything else? Something that creates value from David. Something that creates value and extracts money for it. Okay, that's interesting. Anything else? One or two more and then, and then I'll proceed. Something that makes you money while you don't have to work all day. Anthony, very good. Very, very good. Uh, anyone else? One or two more? A group of people usually teaming up to create value, creating value for our clients and earning income. Something rewarding, in control of your destiny. Service given for money earned. 
These are all really powerful and very, very interesting definitions of commercial activity with the aim of making profit. Okay, good. I uh, thank you so much for, for participating in that. It's, it's very important that this happens continuously through the presentation. Our definition of what a business is, and um, I'd advise you to write this down, please. This is what our definition of a business is. A commercial and profitable enterprise which works without you. So I'll just repeat that. A commercial and profitable enterprise which works without you. Now, if I go back to what I mentioned earlier, uh, about you being an architect. We're not necessarily saying for you to stop being an architect and stop practicing architecture, but we want to give you the choice to, to have time off to, for your business to work without you. That's the whole thing. That's our definition of what a business is, that it's a commercial and profitable enterprise which works without you. So someone like Dave and myself, what is a business coach? Um, and, and is coaching right for you? Our definition is that we're almost like that unreasonable friend who holds you accountable. Dave, I'm sure you kind of find this as well when you know, you're speaking with people and you're working with clients. You do have to be a little bit unreasonable and ask those difficult questions such as, well, why haven't you done it? And you've told me this, but you've done this. And sometimes those conversations are difficult, but it's what it takes to make change and cause change. And is business coaching or, or marketing coaching right for you? Um, not always. You know, if, if you're someone who says, I know, yeah, but, and, and you've got more of a fixed mindset, then probably not for you. However, if you say, go on, I'm listening, that's an interesting idea, then potentially business coaching or marketing coaching will be right for you. And the reason I wanted to share this with you all is, um, you know, what we go through here and what Dave and I do for day to day in terms of coaching is not necessarily for everyone, but we are talking about building businesses that survive, that thrive and grow. And eventually, you know, we want them to be working without you and giving you what you want in life. So very briefly, this is how we work in Action Coach and how we help people. Um, we use a six step system. So we talk about mastery first. We want you, we want to build your foundations. We then go on to niche, which is your USB lead generation, a bit more of the marketing, but it creates predictable cash flow. So you know every month how much money is going to be coming in. We then work on efficiencies, making the business as efficient as it can be. Then we start to grow and putting a structure in place for that. And then it's towards the final stages of a well-oiled machine. And then you as an owner having personal growth. Um, sorry, let someone attend. Uh, you, you as a business owner having personal growth, uh, investing in a new business, maybe even scaling the business that you've got, but you've now got options. And ultimately, we deliver massive results. Time, team and money pain has been alleviated and everything's in place for you to now move forward in life. So before I move on and just highlighting efficiency, because I know how important this is for, for architecture practices, I just want to ask you the question and please note this question down as well. How efficient is your practice? And if you work by yourself, how efficient are you? So the reason I've got a picture of the uh, Red Bull F1 team here is because they recently set a world record for the fastest pit stop. I think it was 1.8 seconds, which is outrageous how fast that is. Um, but back in the 80s and the 90s, you know, this was 15, 20, 30 seconds long. So they've had you know, 10, 15 X improvements in their efficiencies and it's made their team better and everything work faster. And likewise, what we found in architecture in particular is that there's a lot of inefficiency. You know, our timesheets being tracked, is your profitability being tracked in, your, in, in the projects that you're working on? Um, you know, how long are things taking for you to deliver the work for your clients? Because oftentimes you might quote up front a certain price and then by the end of it, you'll realize that actually you've not made that much money. And it all starts from the efficiency. And especially if you've got a team, you know, using things like timesheets, using things um, like correct training systems, processes will make your team and your practice more efficient. Um, especially if you've got a long tail project and it's over you know, a couple of years, it's very important for the team to become efficient. And ideally like Red Bull, where you've got everyone working at the same time, to get everything done super quick. Um, so this is one of the most powerful strategies that we share. And this is the, the big bit at the end of our presentation. And it links very closely to what Dave was saying earlier on. 
um, is one of the most powerful strategies you can use to increase profits and cash flow in your business right now. Um, and, and if you're going to take notes anywhere, if you're going to remember anything about my part of the presentation, this is going to be it. So please do write this down. So these are our five ways. And again, if you've done this presentation with me before, um, I know every time I do this presentation, I always think of my own businesses and remember that there's stuff that I can do better. So please re-engage with this and, and uh, you know, participate. So there's five ways to increase profits in, in our businesses. Number of leads, conversion rate, we've got number of customers, transactions, the average sale value, the turnover, the margin, and the profits. Now, what I wanted to ask you all, and again, answers in the chat box, please, is what do you think the difference is between the, the items in white and the items in yellow? And if you know the answer, just hold back um, and let everyone else have a go first before, before dropping the answer. So uh, who's participated so far? Jonathan, Richard, Karen, David, um, Santoso. What do you think? What does everyone think? What are the differences between the items in white and the items in yellow? I'll just wait for a couple of answers. There's no limit to the items, the ones in yellow. That's true. Uh, Melissa, action. Do you mind expanding on that? What do you mean, action? Control. How do you mean uh, control? Who controls them? Okay. White ones require actions. Okay. The white ones are what you have control over. Yasmin. White ones are variables you can alter. Correct. That, that's exactly it. You, you've hit yellow. Stephen, thank you, Stephen. Yellow are the results. Yellow is the outcome. The white ones are what you can control. The yellow ones are the outcome. And it's really important that you make a note of that. The way in which you affect the outcome, so the items in yellow, how do you affect the number of customers you've got? How do you affect your turnover? How do you affect your profits? You work on the items in white. So please screenshot this, write it down. The number of leads, conversion rate, number of transactions, the average pound value or dollar value or whatever your currency is, and your margin. So let's work through a very simple example here with real numbers. So let's say we've got a business with 4,000 leads. Um, so if you're doing everything that Dave's suggesting that you're doing earlier on in the day, uh, and you've got 4,000 leads coming in from Instagram, you've got your email database, uh, you've got referrals, you've got word of mouth, you've got all the good stuff going on, and you've got 4,000 leads coming in. Um, and let's say you've got a conversion rate of 25%. So what that means is, um, from 4,000 leads that come in, you've got a nice round number of 1,000 customers who convert and decide to do business with us in this example. And so let's say instead of doing business with us once per year, they're going to do business with us twice a year. And every time they do business with us, they're spending 100 pounds. So we've got a nice little business here that does 200,000 pounds a year. So the way that that works is that we've got 1,000 customers interacting with us twice, spending money with us twice, 100 pounds each time, 200,000 pounds a year. And in this example, a 20, 25% profit margin. So that means we've got a nice round profit, profit margin of uh, 50,000 pounds. Now, this is where it starts to get very interesting and why it's important that we start tracking and making notes of these metrics. What would a 10% 10, 10 increase in all of these areas give you? And remember, these are the areas that we can control. So we've now spent six months working with Dave. Our marketing is on fire. We've, we've increased the lead, lead income by, by 10%. So we've got 4,400 leads. We've also been working on the conversion rate. We understand our value. We understand the sales process. We understand what our clients want, and we've improved the conversion rate. So now we've improved it to 27.5%. Um, I'm always interested to, to know how people are following this. What do you think that does to the number of customers we've got? Any, any uh, answers in the chat box if you're good at maths? 
Who thinks it goes from 1,000 to 1,100? Let's have a look. It does increase, Richard. I'm looking at how much. By how much does it increase? 20%-ish. Any other answers? Anyone think it goes to 1,100? I was trying to catch everyone out. It actually increases to 1,210. Now, why is that? Because we've increased 10% across two of the metrics. So we're looking at the power of compounding here. And so the story continues. The number of transactions increases from two to 2.2. And the average sale value goes from 100, 100 pounds to 110. But now our turnover is massive. It's gone from 200,000 to 292,000 pounds in a year, for example. Now, I know in architecture, um, a lot of pushback I get is from the number of transactions. You may only transact with someone once. That's OK. Um, but, you know, people move home every seven to 10 years. So your average number of transactions might be over a longer period of time. But the point is that in this example, um, we've increased the number of transactions by 10 percent, the average pound value. And so the turnover has now gone up massively. Now, this is, again, where it becomes very powerful. We're doing the same exercise with the profit margin. And now our profits have gone from 50,000 to 80,000 pounds. So I just want to let this sink in because all we've done is a 10% increase across all of the metrics that we can, we can control. 10% on the number of leads, the conversion rate, the number of transactions, the average sale value and our margin. And it's just given huge, huge numbers. So 40 46%, as you can see here, turnover increase, 61% profit, uh, which is huge for any, any business. So again, I'm looking for some interaction here, but it, especially if you've not seen this before. Um, if you have, please hold back for the moment. What, which should you tackle first? Uh, just answers in the chat box, please. Let's have a look. So which should you tackle first? The number of leads, the conversion rate, the number of transactions, the average pound value or sale value, should I say, or the margin? Conversion rate, leads, the margin, leads. Let's have a look, conversion rate. What's everyone else saying? All of them, Stephen. The multitasking wizard is able to tackle all of them at the same time. I need you to teach me. Any, any others? Any other ideas? Let's have one or two more. Which should you tackle first? Number of leads, conversion rate, number of transactions, average sale value or margins? One or two more in the chat box. Leads, conversion rate. Okay. This is how we do it. So again, please do take note of this, screenshot this, whatever you need to do. Um, if you take away anything from today's presentation on my part, I want you to take this away because it's going to make instant changes to your business overnight. Start tracking these metrics first and foremost, but the first stage that we wanna start, the first place we start is our margin. It doesn't cost us any money. Increasing your fees and increasing your profit margin is the quickest way to increase the profits in your business. So if you charge, for example, uh, I don't know, a thousand pounds, increase that to 1500 pounds for the same service, add a bit more value, but you know, you're, you're offering more or less the same service, your profit margins have gone up massively. So you start with your profit margin. The second is your conversion rate. Now, how do we increase our conversion rate? Part of it is to do with marketing. Part of it is to know what your sales process is and are you selling your value? Because that's how you improve your conversion rate. What are your guarantees? What's your unique selling point? Why would someone want to do business with you if they've never done business with you in the past? And again, I go back to what Dave talked about earlier. The power of Instagram, the power of your marketing is that it de-risks someone coming to work with you. If they've been following you for a long time on social media and they know that what you're about, they know the projects that you're putting out there, they, you know, a lot of the barriers have been removed. A lot of the risk has been remo removed for them to come and work with you. 
And so when they do start coming to work with you, the ability for you to convert them into a client is going to be a lot easier. And especially if you've got a, a good sales process in place and um, sales, sales scripts and so on and so forth. Number three and number four is the average sale value and the number of transactions. Now, I appreciate in architecture, it's a little bit different when it comes to the number of transactions, but you can definitely work on the average sale value. Uh, and finally, the last thing that we work on is leads. And reason being is because leads are the most expensive things that you can, you can try and get in marketing. It costs you money in one way or another to generate leads. All the other things will not cost you a penny. And so what I mean by that is, let's say, for example, you've got you know, 10, 15, 20 clients that you've worked with already. You know, that's, if you go back to them and maybe get referrals, if you can get three referrals from each of them, you've taken your existing base of 15 clients, multiplied it by three, and now all of, all of a sudden you've got 45 new leads. It's not cost you a penny. Now, those 45 new leads, they may not be needing your services right now, but at least you've now got a database of people you can market to. So leads is the last thing that you work on. So I'm just going to leave this up here for a moment for, for you guys to take notes. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on. Any questions on this at the moment uh, before moving on as well? I know, I know we're going to save, save questions at the end, but just on this in particular, are there any questions or thoughts on this? Um, in the chat box, please. Either everyone's taking notes. You have to put some work into upping the conversion rate, though, right? Yeah, Anthony, correct, of course. It, it takes work. None of this is easy. And I thank you for bringing the point up because none of this is easy. Um, but it, it does take effort and it does take work. Conversion rate is really interesting because, um, you know, oftentimes when I meet people, in particular when it comes to architecture, there's there's almost a bit of a resentment about sales and doing sales. Um, and it's like, well, look, I'm an architect, I shouldn't be doing sales. But actually, if you don't sell your services and if you are not the biggest advocate and champion of your value, then who else is going to do it? And what we're talking about when we come to sales and conversion rate is not you know, being the, 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 the kind of slimy salesperson uh, who's, who's trying to do a deal and take someone's money. But what all, all sales is, is a process that someone goes through to eventually come and do business with you. And that's all sales is. And everyone needs to figure out what their own sales process is and how they can sell their value and increase their conversion rate. Most people, I am sure, don't actually even know what the conversion rate is. Melissa, that's so true. It's so true. I remember when I first saw this, I wasn't tracking any of these metrics. Any of these metrics, it was the most terrifying thing in the world and I didn't know where to start. So I started with the margin. That's the first thing that I tracked. Um, but you're right. Um, very few people will be tracking their conversion rate. So what you could do in this instance is maybe look back at your last five projects and think about how many leads potentially came in for you to get those five projects. How many conversations have you had? How many, how many pitches have you sent out? And then how many, lead, how many deals did you, did you um, get out of that? Maybe over the last three months, there's, there's ways to do it, but you're, that's a really, really good point, Melissa. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, charging for the first site, site visit and providing cost options based on the services massively increased my conversion rates from Natalie. I appreciate you sharing that, Natalie. But there you go. That's, that's a brilliant way of increasing your conversion rate. The fact that you're going out and doing more than someone else would do, you're meeting the client, um, you're charging for the first site visit as well, which shows that you've got value attached to you um, and having multi-tiered cost options. Brilliant, brilliant strategy. Typically, what, what will people go for? They won't go for the most expensive. They won't go for the, the cheapest. They'll go for the mid-level. Most people would. And so if you've got those three options presented and worked out for a client, it makes it easier for them to make the choice. So 
uh, the webinar will be uh, recorded as well. So I'm going to send this out to everyone. Um, hopefully everyone's taken notes on this. So what's the next stage? Um, Dave, uh, if you want to jump in on this as well, that would be really appreciated. And then we'll go into questioning. Um, the next stage for us, uh, previously we used to leave this as, look, if you want to have uh, some one-to-one -one coaching, uh, we do have the option uh, available for you. I can put a link in the chat box and, and uh, you can have a gifted one-to-one -one coaching session with, with me and my, my colleagues in Parag in particular um, to help you grow your business and identify some of the frustrations that you're working on. Um, and, and actually, the change that we've now made is that we want to make this a part of the webinar. We want everyone to attend the one-to-one the -one coaching session so we know that actually you're going to take action from this. Rather than just attending the webinar, taking some, some notes, potentially taking some value from it, and then off you go. We actually want you to attend the coaching session. It takes a few minutes to fill in the, the questionnaire and we want you to get ongoing value and we want you to take action. We want to see you change from where you are today to where you want to go moving forward. So um, what I'm going to do is put a quick link in the chat box. And Dave, um, let me just end this and end my share screen. Uh, Dave's got a similar offer for yourselves. Like, Dave, do you want to just share your? Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, mate. No worries. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll grab mine too. Um, when uh, when we first uh, discussed this gifted co consultation, I thought it was a fantastic idea. So I'm also I've set up something uh, just separately um this isn't available through my website um a 30 minute gifted zoom consultation um if you go to vanityprojects.com slash action coach it'll take you to my calendly uh it is basically on a first come first serve basis though and as you can see there's not that many days available over the coming months so um if if we end up meeting a little bit of time off in the future um hopefully that will be okay <laughs> but um this op that that Zoom is an opportunity for us. We can have a discussion about some of the uh, topics that were brought up in, in today's webinar, or otherwise we can have a bit of a discussion around any other issues that you're having with your marketing as well. So please feel free to take that up if you're interested. Appreciate that, Dave. Um, so yeah, should we should we just? I mean, we're we're quite ahead of time actually. So we've got we've got time for um, some Q and A um yep. are there any questions or real life situations that people are in any current business frustrations uh that maybe we could work through together because if, if you're thinking it no doubt someone else might be thinking it and going through the same thing as well um and we can maybe yeah maybe go off mute and, and just have a verbal as well so just if you could put some questions and thoughts in the chat box um and we can we could take it from there Actually, what I would like to ask everyone, uh, and I would appreciate, Dave, I'm sure Dave as well, would really, really appreciate your participation and response to this. We've got 40 people in, in the event. What was the biggest takeaway for you from today's, from today's webinar? Would you mind just sharing that in the chat box with us? The one biggest takeaway, the one biggest light bulb moment that you've had from this event. Just share that in the chat box, please. Jez is saying, I find it hard photog photographing projects as I'm always firefighting the next project. Yeah. Yes, that, that, that can be tricky, Jez, but you'll look back at it and think you'll be kicking yourself if you don't take the time to do it. You don't have to invest the heart, all of your resources equally in every single project, but make sure that you know you are stopping to smell the roses and taking good photos of your work and that's what you're going to be relying on over time to to you know attract the right type of clients um so you just got to do it mate yeah that, <laughs> i think also is um I, I don't know if this this helps at all uh jez actually you know what let me just take you off mute uh, it might be nice to have a little chat so jez i'm just taking you off mute hang on
well, I guess not, it's not really working. Um, but what I tend to do, I've got, I've got um, a, a bunch of freelance photographers that we've got on our books. And anytime we complete a project for one of my businesses, so we do um, hoarding, signage and scaffolding rats for developments. Uh, and every time we complete a project, uh, one of my team members instantly contacts the freelancer, sees who's available and gets them down to the site. The day of completion, they go down to the site, they're taking pictures, they're taking videos, and we use them for our marketing. And actually that marketing is helping us generate new leads all of the time. So a prime example, uh, Jez, of how powerful this is, is um, we recently completed a job for a, a developer in central London. Um, we had the video taken and the pictures taken almost immediately. A week later, we were running Facebook ads and in two weeks, we've had 40 leads coming in off the back of those Facebook ads. So that's just how powerful it, it, it is and how, how it works because people are responding to that content because it's so high end. Hope that helps, um, Jess. Uh, Richard. I'll, I'll yeah, go for it. So, sorry, no, go, no, go ahead, mate. Uh, yes, oh, no, yes. uh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> All right, go, go. No, no, I'll, I'll read Richard's question then. Paradigm shift is needed. Too used to doing things a certain way and scared of change. No, that's true. That's, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to make those changes. But I think once you know what the new direction is, it does become easier. Or if in my case, I don't know if you've come across this, Dave, like if you know what you don't want anymore, you just start going away from that and then you end up going towards what, what's more in line with what you want. Um, Jez is saying, uh, thanks for the advice. Need to get someone to do the architecture so I can do the marketing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jez, you're in a room full of architects. Anyone, anyone <laughs> want to work with Jez? You need someone to do the architecture so he can do the marketing. Um, just out of interest, uh, again, in the chat box, please. Um, any, is anyone interested in the um, in, in the one-to-one -one coaching call? There's no charge or anything like that. As I said, we just want to make sure that you take action from this event um, and, and, and move forward. So just put a yes in the chat box if, if there is some interest or a no, uh, just so that we know as well, please. Um, whilst we're waiting, um, Oh, Melissa's booked one already, right? <laughs> Very interested, Richard. S just whilst people are answering that question, um, Stephen, reaching potential clients seems a lot harder than reaching other architects or professionals. Do you have any advice on increasing reach to clients? I think David. Uh, sure. I'll take that one. Um, yeah, so look, it, architects, we do tend to talk to each other quite a bit. Um, I... Reaching out to clients, I think, is you know, it's it is about getting out there and trying to be trying to be more helpful, right? And also just being more active in general. I think a lot of the time, you know, we don't get much further than our peers because we're not actually being that active in our marketing more generally, which is kind of something I touched on in the talk earlier. Um, we just we do the bare minimum, you know. We'll enter some awards and we sit there waiting for one or two, you know, journalists to reach out or something. But beyond that, I mean, what are, what are we actually doing to get out? To non-architects, right? So taking a little bit of accountability, I think is important not to have a go at you, Stephen, because I think you're already doing plenty. Uh, but you know, it's a common problem. So firstly, check, is that the issue? I mean, am I actually doing enough, right? Um, but then going from there, I think if you are really finding that it is hard to get out to, to non-architects, then you may just want to explore sort of non-traditional options for how you market your practice. I mean, you may want to look at some social media ads like Cooks was suggesting, or you may want to think about, you know, SEO, maybe answer some common questions on your blog um, or create some really helpful resources that people are looking for that other architects are not interested in, you know, um, putting together like one of those examples I had of like, 
you know, maybe some, some construction cost guidelines or something for your area or something to do with, you know, um, parts of the process or explaining, explaining and breaking down how architects fees work, you know, other architects aren't going to be Googling that. That's going to be people that are out there that are potential clients looking for that information. So I just think you just want to try and think about what can we do to break out of that normal pattern that every other architect's in. And that's a good way to look at it. I also saw a comment from somebody directly that they clicked on my link and it was in the early hours of uh, my uh, Calendly and most of my meetings were between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. in that time zone. Um, unfortunately, that is the downside of dealing with somebody in Melbourne. So uh, if, you don't, if you don't find a time there that's suitable, just send me an email. We might be able to work something out. So dave at vanityprojects.com if you want or just go through my website. I think I just wanted to add to that as well, Dave, that it goes back to changing your environment, right? Like if you're doing the same thing, you're surrounded by the same people, maybe it's time to do something different to get different results. Um, I mean, it's an extreme example. And I'm just thinking, like, what would I do if I was an architect? Where are my potential clients hanging out? Um, or where would people be going? And how could I expose myself to those types of clients? And it's, I mean, it's certainly not easy, but... Um, I don't know, maybe, would you, would you go to Ikea, Dave, and have a little stand outside Ikea because people are shopping for furniture and things like that? And You know, you know. It's, a, it's, a great, it's a great example. Sometimes, you know, it's not the thing that, um, you know, like I, I'll spend a lot of time thinking about digital marketing with my clients, but then I've had clients surprise me and go and set up a stand at a farmer's market in their area and just absolutely rake it in with potential good clients. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they've taught me a lesson that it, you know, it isn't just the social media stuff, you know, getting out there and getting down, getting your hands dirty and getting out there into the streets is not a terrible idea. <laughs> you I mean, know, you know what? Particular... I think especially now, like, you know, people are, you know, we've been in lockdown for almost two years and I know we're out of it, but, the, you know, Zoom, Zoom life and doing anything real well, doing anything that's, that's different, I think is always going to be attracting a lot of attention. And especially if you do it locally and you want to work locally as well, I, I think it's a great shout. Yeah, um, doing, doing in-person stuff, it's, it's challenging and it takes effort, but it's some of the most uh, successful and rewarding stuff like um, that I, I've seen done. I mean, wh whether we're talking an open house, you know, inviting, opening up a registration page and having people come around to actually visit your finished projects you wouldn't believe like what an impact that has on people to actually step inside your work. I mean, you can't recreate that on Instagram really. Mm. So managing that is something that you really want to think about doing, but even if you can't get to a, a finished project because a client doesn't want, you know, a bunch of strangers traipsing through their, um, through their living room, then consider even opening up an invitation for people to come to a site visit while the project's in progress, they'll get a good enough idea of the quality of the work and get a chance to meet you. So there's lots of things that you can do that can, you know, I put those things as examples of really great stuff that you would post or announce on social media or put on your website or send to your email list that are going to get people to actually take action and come meet you and interact with you. And that's when they're going to start getting a sense of, you know, what a, what a legit and trustworthy architect you are. Um, but yeah, that, that in-person stuff is like the Holy grail. If you have come up with any good ideas of, of events that you can actually run, then, oh, mate, go ahead and do it for sure. And again, you can really tie, for example, we build on this idea, you could tie that into the five ways, right? If you run, if you run a event of some kind and you get 50 people that turn up, you know, you've got a higher chance of converting people from that because, you know, that's, because they're there, they can see, feel, touch your work, they can speak with you. So your conversion rate is going to be higher from those leads and actually, you know, they're in a buying mode because they're there already and they're, they're, they're probably going to be spending more as well with you. If you've worked out your sales process and what the next stages are for that person to become a client with you. Yep. Um, I'll add one, I'll add one extra idea to it as well that, you know, even, even the, the, this webinar that we're doing is a good example of a collaboration between two people that have similar um, yeah. similar audiences and things like that. You, I've seen examples with clients where they've been very successful in maybe not even running these kinds of events solo, but also reaching out to other related, um, you know, entrepreneurs or, or disciplines in their area and doing like a joint event, a joint event. So, 
you know, an architect plus a really, really high end real estate agent in the real, in doing a, doing a sort of a Q and a town hall on like really how to understand, you know, this local area and things like that has been some, has been incredibly successful in the past, you know, a line of clients out the door, you know, waiting to speak to the architect afterwards sort of thing. So there's, um, there's lots of good options to, that you can experiment with. Um, even if you don't feel as confident about the online stuff, or you feel more like more comfortable actually networking and actually being out there, then that's possibly a good avenue for you. Uh, um, just out of interest, because this is one thing that um, I'm not exposed to is actually going out and working with, with clients. How, how would you potentially go about working with property developers? And where would you find people like that? Because I know here in the UK, uh, you know, there's, you know, property developer events, there's um, you, these kind of uh, networking or pro real world seminar events where, where property investors come together and they, they're always in need of architect services, right? And I'm sure, again, if you talk about collaboration, if you're collaborating with a speaker, someone who's well known in, in property, that again might be a very powerful way to, to to win new clients right yeah i mean it, it depends if you um obviously those are going to events like that can be a really good option but um you might you might even take it up to another notch and think well maybe i should maybe i should pick some of the better known or more influential mm -hmm. developers in my city and maybe i should interview them you know and post those interviews on my website or post them on social media it doesn't have to be a recorded thing it could just be a written thing send them some questions and that's going to help you even a fairly straightforward little idea like that will help you to get some exposure to that audience and do it in a way that builds trust and sort of rapport without you actually directly, you know, schmoozing or selling, right? Not that there's anything wrong with selling, but done too early or too aggressively, it can put people off. But if you spend time and a patient and you do things like interviews and you try to actually help that developer community as best you can. What could I do as an architect with my skills and the tools that I have to help you or to create some value for you or to, to take some information I could give to you for free, for example, um, that builds trust and builds brand awareness over maybe, maybe you spend six months doing that and you're proactive about doing that. When you finally do step into that room and start meeting people, you're a very different character walking into that room you're someone that they appreciate you being part of their industry and so little things like that uh, it, it's it's worth being patient about but getting creative in terms of what can i do to you know add add to that community of developers in the city and so that they're kind of grateful that you know our our practice is here as an architect mm -hmm. yeah um we still got a couple of minutes if if people want to be involved um any more questions for for dave or for me or just in general any thoughts um just drop them in the chat box and as always you know you might be thinking it other people may be thinking it so please don't feel shy uh to, to put the questions in the chat box there's no such thing as a, a silly question or a simple question um they're normally the best ones if i'm being honest no new questions at the moment dave anything that you want to add if whilst people are potentially thinking of questions my favorite part of your presentation was going through the the formula of the different phases and i particularly like that where you spoke about what difference a 10 percent difference makes at each of those stages that really spoke to me because i think people um uh, it's hard to perceive the compounding effect like compounding is not an easy concept to get your head around mm. but those little percentage differences really add up and sometimes i think uh we feel like we need to make such huge leaps to make progress and that leads us into a kind of perfectionism and over planning. And we tend to just procrastinate, right? Because we perceive it that we need to make huge jumps. Whereas the best examples I've seen working with my clients is where they've just been focused on continually little incremental bits of progress every month, every week. They're just putting in an effort and making everything a little bit better 
as they go mm. and the results just add up like crazy over time um, and it doesn't have to feel like you're pushing a massive boulder like we need to radically change everything in the next couple of you know weeks or a month right so that was that was the part that's really stood out to me about your talk as well and just just really that and the fact that it, you only made it like 10 percent, i think is such a good demonstration of the power I, of those I appreciate that and and like I said the first time I saw it, it it blew me away and and I knew that I wasn't first of all tracking those metrics but when I did start to track them like you said it just makes such a huge difference um because it's all, all all of a sudden it's a bit manageable and and when it all stacks up together it just it changes everything so much um and you know increasing your prices by 10 percent, for example it's not actually that much or increasing your margin by 10%, it's not actually that much. And it's, it's a bit more feasible and, and, and um, easier to do than, like you said, trying to jump up 50% and scaring everyone off. Totally. There, there was another thing that really stood out there as well, which was you pointed out that, you know, that you would work on leads last and work on those other things first, the yeah. margin first and so on. And as a marketing person, you know, I'm probably expected to like, oh, take issue with that. No, no, no. You've got to work on leads first. But I agree with you 100%. <laughs> I completely back what you're saying. And, and I've seen uh, there are like kind of two kind of clients that sort of walk in my door for help. And there's the person that has reached this kind of crisis point where the studio, it, you know, it's, it's taking over their life, like unprofitable. They haven't had a break in ages. Then they're, they're just, they're struggling. They're worried about some precipice in their cash flow. They're looking ahead out with their projects. And it's just, it piles a mountain of pressure on top of their marketing. And I think it actually puts you in a really bad mindset to even be approaching marketing properly. Like I spoke a couple of minutes ago about how it's important to be like patient and not push it too hard, too quickly. Yeah, yeah. And when you haven't resolved those other areas of your business plan, I feel like it just piles pressure on marketing and it doesn't, it does not suit it. Whereas I've seen the other type of client where they've gone through a process where they have worked on profitability and we've worked on our proposals and we've improved our fees and our margins have improved and we've made some good staff and structural changes. And they're in a, this very sort of peaceful, tranquil mindset. <laughs> and when I see a client like that and they're ready to go with their marketing and they're like, We'll work on it. We're organized. We've got time for it. We're not, you know, trying to squeeze in 20 minutes a month. We're like, we've got some time to sit back and think because we're not under too much pressure. Yeah, yeah. Like that's like, that's like my dream client. I mean, they don't come along every day, but, <laughs> uh, but, but like, I, I love a client like that because, you know, take the pressure off a little bit and, and give yourself time to think and do things right. Um, and so, I don't know, I, I agree with you absolutely. In an ideal world, you probably, you'd stay, I think Stephen was it earlier commented about doing all at once and, you know, multitasking. There probably is always going to be like a little bit of that multitasking going yeah. on. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think that is a fair way to deal with it. And I think really also the other, the other point of it is that, you know, if you remember I was saying um, leads cost you money and if you're generating a ton of leads, but you're yep. not really converting that many, eventually yep. you're going to think marketing is crap and it doesn't work. Exactly. And you'll stop doing marketing. I, I've also, um, you know, surprisingly, I, I don't really spend a lot of time with my clients necessarily just discussing quantity of leads and nobody comes to me and says, I want to get my quantity of leads up. That's not usually the issue for, for a business, for an architecture practice once it gets up and running. A lot of the time, the issue is the quality of the leads, mm -hmm. the conversion rate of those leads mm -hmm. and so on. And that's what we really want to focus on. It comes more to those things you touched on about our value isn't clear to anybody. People don't trust us. They don't know anything about us. They don't know why they'd pick us versus the 15 other architects down the road, right? Those are more of the deeper issues. Um, so it really, it really isn't just about leads. And I've found that architects that haven't got their, their conversion rate right, their margins right, those things right, they tend to be on this lead generating treadmill where they always need more leads. And they're always, it's always a crisis if we don't get another however many leads next month. And that's not a good position to be in at all. And, and often that's a symptom. It's expensive. It's expensive. Because you guys like, use I, house, I, right? Is it so, house? No, no, no. Some, some architects do. That's, that's one method. But I mean, it's expensive, whether it's expensive in terms of money or time. Right, the, right, right. It, it's not easy to generate leads. It does not happen effortlessly. But for some clients, 
a certain quantity of high quality leads is sustainable. And for others, no matter how many leads there are, because those other things aren't configured properly, it, it just is not, it's never going to kind of replenish what that business needs. And so you have to be thinking more comprehensively about your business and not just on your marketing. And I'll say that as a marketing person <laughs> and getting some assistance with those other areas as well. I always, I always feel really happy when my clients tell me that they've either been or are about to start working with a business coach, because I know that I'm going to be working with a more productive, better equipped client in a couple of months time. Yeah, so yeah. I, I always find it helpful. Um, I noticed a couple of marketing questions are in the chat uh, and social media stuff. Should I just, can I just quickly yeah, race through those? Um, so Natalie has gaps in the whole year between photos. Yeah, so it sort of touched on that earlier. So actually don't be afraid of reusing some of your existing photos, um, at space them out, think about, think about it. Think about some of those supplementary categories to kind of fill those gaps a little bit more. Um, but you just have to kind of make do with what you've got. Um, not posting and not being on social media for months at a time is definitely not an option. Um, so Lucia, I'm trying to cut down on social media on a personal basis. So allocating a lot of time to Instagram and the company doesn't feel very exciting. Is it necessary evil? Uh, yeah, I don't think you need to be personally interested in social media at all. I'm not. Um, I'm a very like digital turn it all off kind of person. Uh, you don't need to be. It's, you're not doing it for your own personal satisfaction. You're just doing it. You're doing it for business. And so you only need to be on it personally to the extent that you're learning about how the platform works. But that doesn't mean you need to sit on the couch every night, you know, scrolling through Instagram for hours to get that information. You can get that from a couple of YouTube videos to keep you abreast of what's happening. You can follow certain people who are putting out good information about it. So no, you don't need to be personally super invested in social media. Um, can you please recommend some platforms for scheduling posts? Uh, you mentioned later, but are there others to recommend? So yeah, I generally recommend later, but um, other options that I've seen work reasonably well for my clients on Instagram is Planoli. Um, a couple of firms use Hootsuite and they're happy with that. And a couple use Buffer and you know, stick with it. But I personally don't think Buffer is very good for Instagram. Um, Just to add to that, Dave, it, we move yeah. to the next one. Um, Facebook have got their own free platform called Creator Studio. So if you've yep. got a Facebook business page for your for your practice, um, if you in in the search bar, just type in um, Facebook Creator Studio, you can use that to schedule uh, videos and posts to your main feed and onto your yep. Facebook page as well and onto your Instagram. It's a very good point. Um, yeah, that that's absolutely an option. I would I would only use the Facebook Creator Studio or, or any tool based on um, based on whether the tool suits your needs, right? Um, I, I don't think cost should be a factor because whether you're paying $9 a month for later or you're paying you know, $30 a month for SCED, which is actually one I should have mentioned as well, SCED's also another really good tool, or you're using the free creator studio, um, ultimately you're trying to be efficient and save your time, which is so valuable. So just use the tool that's gonna save you time. So try all of them, I would suggest, you know, give them all a go and see how they go. Um, marketing wise, I often hear it's very tough and difficult for small practices to get their work featured in printed media compared to well-known firms who are always out there with their names. Um, yes, look, it can be, but you know, I think of all, of all publications, the journalists at the print magazines, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they actually really do care about the quality of the work that goes in their magazine. And so it is, it, uh, maybe I'm just too optimistic, but I think it's pretty meritocratic and you've just got to do good work, work with a good photographer. I think the photographer you choose is more, more, it's more about the photographer you choose than anything else. And if you're not working with a photographer that is regularly featured in that publication, you don't, you, I would say your odds are not great that you're going to end up in there. Um, so if, if anything, if your goal is to get into a certain publication, like let's say you want to be in houses magazine in australia or what have you i would take the last three issues and flip through and write down every single photographer they worked with and that should almost be a short list for you in terms of who could i work with for my next project that's going to greatly improve your chances of getting in that magazine and your photographer and that editor will probably have an existing relationship you guys can probably see my dog going absolutely bananas in the background right now <laughs> having a great time He's having an awesome time. It's almost his dinner. Um, <laughs> he hides behind me the whole time I'm doing my work. Um, 
And if the best photographer you can afford is with your camera, then that's just how it's going to have to be um, and, and go for it. But, you know, you can get a pretty good photographer. We're talking hundreds of pounds, not, not tens of thousands or anything. So you can, you can work with somebody, you can make it happen. And if you're just getting started, you don't have a portfolio yet, I would not spend a, a, a penny on anything else if you haven't invested that money in the photography, you know, in terms of marketing, like I wouldn't run ads. I wouldn't, you know, hire an SEO agency for a thousand dollars a month. I wouldn't go on house and spend 400 pounds a month or whatever they're going to charge you. I wouldn't spend money on those things instead of photography. I'll do that first within reason. Right. And if you can get little video clips as well, they're really powerful when you, for when you run ads. Yeah. Uh, you know, five oh, to 10 second clips. Video, video is massive. I mean, didn't really touch on that, but that's also a crucial way that you can kind of differentiate yourself from other firms as well, video in general. And day to day, you know, I, I didn't touch on it too much in the Instagram section, but stories, I mean, you want to take a very efficient approach to your feed, but day to day, you want to be posting stories quite a lot and doing that very spontaneously off your phone and taking, capturing your own photos and taking your own little videos is going to make your account feel so much more authentic than taking a really like professional polished approach to stories. So Cooks isn't spot on, you know, take your own little videos and post them to your stories and that will go down really well. Yeah. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, I think that we're, we've actually gone over now uh, with the <laughs> Q&A, which is uh, hopefully you got value from it. I, I was happy to be here. Dave, no doubt, was happy to be there and answer those questions. Um, thank you so much for attending today. Well done for making the time to work uh, on yourself and to, to work, to, to, sorry, to learn new information, to learn new knowledge and to join uh, for, for joining us. Um, we will send an email out to everyone as well. Um, with the links to the, the sessions Dave and I are Dave and I are offering, um, and if you need anything else, feel free to respond to those emails and, and we can catch up. Um, but hopefully, you got masses of value from it. I know I did. It's, I'm always learning from these types of things, and working with Dave's been brilliant as well. So, um, yeah, thank you, thank you, everyone, and um, speak to you all soon. Dave, should we maybe catch up um, on email? Or are you, you okay to stay on for a couple of minutes? Yeah, yeah. go for it. Should we, Bye, should we join another? Yeah, See everyone. Take care. Bye, everyone.